Focus your attention on the breath. Take a couple of good, long, deep in and out breaths. And notice where you feel the sensation of breathing in the body. Focus your attention there. And then ask yourself if it's comfortable. If long breathing feels good, keep it up. If not, you can change. Make it shorter, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter, faster, slower. Or you can try in long and out short, or in short and out long. See what kind of breathing feels good. If you find something that feels good, stick with it for a while until it doesn't feel good, so good anymore. And then you can change again. The needs of the body will ch change as your mind begins to settle down. If your thoughts begin to wander off to something else, remind yourself you're not there for that. You're here to develop some concentration. So drop those thoughts and you're back at the breath. No matter how many times you wander off, you just keep coming back to the breath. When you do come back, reward yourself with a breath that feels especially good. When we talk of breath here, it's not so much the air coming in and out of the, lung, the lungs through the nose. It's more the flow of energy in the body, which you can feel any place in the body at all. Then as the breath gets comfortable, think of that sense of ease beginning to spread through the different parts of the body, so that the energy flowing through the body feels good all the way in, all the way out. And just maintain the sense of being with comfortable breathing. You can make the range of your awareness as large as you can. You can fill the body with it if you want. Some people, though, when they start out, find that being aware of the whole body is a little bit too distracting. So you can pick, focus on one spot or one section of the body. Make that your home for the hour. If you leave home, you won't have good reasons. Otherwise, stay right here. You notice that as you're doing this, you're talking to yourself. In Pali, that's called vitaka and vichara, to direct a thought and evaluation. This can become one of the factors of jhana, or mental absorption, when the mind gets really well concentrated in the first stage. When we hear that it's a factor of jhana, it sounds kind of exotic. But it's actually simply a matter of learning how to talk to yourself well, in an effective way to get the mind to settle down. So much of our suffering in life comes from the way we talk to ourselves in an unskillful way. Which is why a lot of the Buddhist teachings are designed to help you talk to yourself in a more skillful way. It starts with the right view. The basic principles of the right view are that there is suffering in life, and it's caused by the actions of your mind. That's not to place blame on you, it's to point to you that there's an opportunity if you change the actions of your mind and you don't have to suffer. And suffering can be put to an end. You do have that choice. Sometimes you know people say that we have no freedom of choice, that either everything is determined by our past actions or simply by physical laws. But those ideas block the path. As the Buddha said, when you're not really sure about things like that, it's a good bet to adopt a view that makes you responsible, allows for you to be responsible, and opens possibilities for the range of the actions that you can do. Sirius says it is possible to act in a way that puts an end to suffering. You may not know if that's true or not, but it's a good view to adopt, because it encourages you to look more carefully at your actions. and have a higher sense of what can be accomplished in life. It 
So right view gives you some good principles to hold in mind as you talk to yourself. And there's something the Buddha calls appropriate attention when you apply those principles to what you're actually doing. As the Four Noble Truths have duties. Suffering is something you want to comprehend. Its cause is something you want to abandon. Its cessation is something you want to realize. And the path is something you want to develop. So when something unskillful comes up in the mind, you notice this is something to be abandoned. And then you learn ways to abandon things like sensual desire, ill will, sleepiness, restlessness, uncertainty. There are ways of dealing with each of these. You recognize them as they come into the mind. And you know which category they fall into. They're the causes for suffering. So you want to abandon them. Then there are good qualities that come up in the mind. Mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. Alertness, your ability to watch what you're doing and to see the results that you're getting. And then ardency, your desire to do this well. Those things you want to encourage. So we remember the principles of right view. This is what right mindfulness is for. Mindfulness is not simply bare attention. It's a faculty of the active memory. We remember things that are useful to know, useful to apply to what you're doing. In this case, you take the principles of right view and you remember to apply them. That way you learn how to talk to yourself in a way that, instead of causing problems for the mind, actually helps to solve them. And so right now we're trying to develop concentration. So talk to yourself in a way that helps the mind to settle down. Any thoughts that would come in and tell you that you can't do this, it's beyond you, you can put those aside. Any thoughts that come in and say that you're bored or that you're in pain in some part, part of the body, you can put those aside too. When you're dealing with pains, the best principle is not to focus directly on them. Focus on the parts of the body that you can make comfortable. So you can have a place in the present moment where you feel at ease, where you feel that you belong here. As for the voices in the mind that say, can't stand the pain, it's too much for me, I can't do this. Think of them as committee members in your mind who have not been very helpful. So why pay them any attention? Try to direct the conversation in the committee in a better direction. Talk to yourself about the parts of the body that are comfortable. And then think of that sense of ease, that breath energy from those parts spreading to go through the parts that are pained. In other words, you can approach pain with more confidence that you have some tools to deal with it. All too often we're bewildered by our pain and have no idea how to get past it, and we get afraid of it. I was part of a psych experiment when I was a student. I'd been meditating up before that, and the experiment was to put your hand in a bucket full of ice water, lots of ice cubes. And I was told to think of the warmth in my other hand coming into the hand that was in the pail, and the coolness of the hand in the pail going to the other hand. So I did that for quite a few minutes, and they finally said, okay, you can stop, you're breaking the curve. It turned out the experiment was designed to see how different approaches to pain would affect the way people could stand pain. 
There was one group of people who were told, put your hand in the ice water, and when it gets uncomfortable, pull it out. The second group was told, put your hand in the ice water and just see how long you can keep it there. But they weren't given a technique for dealing with that sense of discomfort. And the third group was told what I was told. And they found, of course, that the third group could keep their hands in the ice water a lot longer than the other two groups. So learn to talk to yourself in a way that you can convince yourself that, yes, you can stand pain, you can stand boredom, you can stand all kinds of other unpleasant things. And that way, the way you talk to yourself actually strengthens you. All too often we weaken ourselves by the way we talk to ourselves. But we can change the conversation. If you've been meditating for a long time and you get discouraged about your meditation, you don't let that voice get in the way. Some people simply take longer to develop some skill at this practice. It's not the case that if it takes a while that you have no hope, simply that you've got more work to do than other people do. But this is a skill that anyone can develop. This is one of the things the Buddha has you tell yourself. If skillful qualities were impossible to develop, he wouldn't have taught it. If unskillful qualities were impossible to abandon, he wouldn't have taught that either. This is something human beings can do. You're a human being. You can do it. Talk to yourself in that way. And as for the voices that threaten you, say, you try to give me up and I'm going to cause trouble. Again, that's a way of talking to yourself that is not really helpful. You're placing obstacles in your way. You're limiting the possibilities of what you can do simply by the way you talk to yourself. So I talk that way. You have the choice. Talk to yourself in a way that's encouraging. There is a potential, the Buddha says, for a rapture in the body, a potential for a sense of fullness and ease, well-being here in the present moment. Focus on those potentials. When you're feeling sleepy, you remind yourself there is a potential for energy someplace in the body. When you're feeling restless, there is a potential for calm someplace in the body and the mind. Find that. One of the reasons we sit here for an hour is that it places some limitations on us. And you have the question of, are you going to sit here and talk to yourself in a way that makes yourself miserable, or are you going to sit here and talk to yourself in a way that actually gets the mind to settle down? The choice is yours. You're putting the mind on the spot. And if you rise to the challenge, you develop a lot of good skills. And you get more confident in how you can approach the present moment. A lot of people are afraid of the present moment. They do everything they can to fill it up with other things, rather than simply be with their minds in the present. I visited people in the hospital and they spend their last weeks of their lives watching television, rather than looking at their own minds. It's sad. It's an important part of your life. How are you going to leave this life and go on to the next? You should be spending the time developing the skills that you're going to need. Yeah, there are so many people who <clears throat> run away from what's really important in life. It's how they relate to their own minds. Because they don't have any skills, they don't have any advice on how to do it properly. This is what the Buddha is providing us with. It's good advice on how to relate to our minds here in the present moment, how to talk to ourselves in a way that opens more possibilities for genuine happiness. Because even though the Buddha is talking a lot about suffering in those Four Noble Truths, the purpose is to find happiness, a happiness that is not dependent on conditions. 
That's what that Third Noble Truth is, the cessation of suffering. It's possible to put a total end to suffering, something human beings can do. Human action is capable of doing this. You're a human being. Take it as a challenge. At the very least, you realize it's better than contenting yourself with what little pleasures the rest of the world has to offer, the things they can sell you, the things they can provide you with. And when they make you dependent on them, them for the pleasures, and they're the things they can control you with. Whereas if you can provide your own inner happiness, you're free. That's one of the meanings of the word nirvana, freedom. That's what we're here for, and it is possible. So talk to yourself in a way that helps make that possible. Don't talk to yourself in a way that gets in the way. <laughs>